I want to go back 22 years to the mid-1990s when my second daughter was still a toddler. She's, in fact, here with me this evening. Um, and every day I used to take her along to playgroups and library sing-alongs and romps in the park. And quite often I was the only dad present. And I remember on one of those play days, a mother came up to me and she was a newbie in the group. And she said, it's so nice that you take a turn with the babysitting. Well, I sort of bristled inside, but I didn't say anything. A little bit later, when I was changing my daughter's nappy, she kind of hovered over me as if she was inspecting my handiwork. And again, I didn't say anything. Finally, when my daughter was tired and tetchy, she scooped her up and she said to me, you go get yourself a nice cup of tea. We mums will look after her. Well, I'm sure she meant well, but I didn't respond very kindly. I just said, I retrieved my daughter and I, sa I said to her, I really don't need your help, thank you. And uh, by the way, I'm not taking a turn with the babysitting. I'm just doing what comes naturally. Now, over the previous few years of parenting, I'd had a few experiences which suggested that not everybody thought that the presence of fathers in playgroups was quite so natural. Sometimes it was just a quizzical look or a, a backhanded compliment. Well done, Dad, as if I had special needs. Or maybe just being <laughs> left out of the, the, the playful banter. But it, it was that babysitting one that really struck. And I remember for the rest of that session, I made less effort with the other parents. And I think behind that was a sort of fleeting suspicion that I was there as an imposter. Maybe some of you have had that experience in, in different circumstances before. Anyway, when I went home that afternoon, I sort of chewed it over. And I thought that behind that well-meaning mother's response was a view that fathers were not natural carers, that they lacked the required mindset and skills for the job. And the reason it exasperated me so much was because I knew from my own experience that this wasn't true. So it didn't take me very long to join up the dots and to see that that little experience of prejudice on the sing-along circuit might just have something in common with the experience of so many women in the world at work, the false assumption that because of their gender, they weren't quite up to the job. And it was then that it dawned on me that fatherhood is a feminist issue. Now, I want to row back a little bit and to say something about my own upbringing. My own father, Bruce Evans, was very much head of the family. He said so himself as he sat at the head of the table what he called the head of the table. And he worked six days a week, long hours. My mother, Joan Evans, or occasionally Mrs. Bruce Evans, didn't have a job of her own. Her role was to support my father and to look after the three children. Now, that didn't mean that my loving dad played no domestic role. He could change a nappy, he could wash the dishes, he could dispense advice, he would listen to us, and he was the last word in discipline, which very occasionally took on physical dimensions. So that then was the model of fatherhood that I grew up with. And just to add to the picture, I was sent to an all-boys state school, where I very soon learned to keep a stiff upper lip when being caned. And we would march around in khaki uniforms, and I learned to handle guns. And then outside the school gates, this kind of male-only world was reinforced by um, my obsession with boxing. Uh, my maiden career ambition was to be heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> yeah, that one worked out really well. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have any really intimate female friends until I was 17. And I guess all this is well dug in because the impact of your first 17 years of life is very likely to be more profound than the impact of much of what follows. But when I went to university, I was first confronted with feminist ideas. And this prompted me to change many of the notions that I'd grown up with. But the more profound challenge, I think, came when I had two children of my own. And they were both daughters, and I longed for them to excel in life and not to be held back by the sexist detritus of the culture around them. And I also realized, a little bit to my surprise, actually, that I was 
quite good with looking after children and that I wanted to play at least an equal role in their upbringing. And so we arranged our lives and work accordingly. We were both providers and we both played equal roles in the child rearing and the housework, worked out in meticulous detail. And, and by the way, when we finally got married, my uh, wife didn't become an, another Mrs. Evans. Now, all this was hardly typical of my generation, I'd have to admit. But by 1990, when my first child was born, I think things were starting to change, but gradually and unevenly. And I realized this because as a result of these experiences, I began researching this issue and then writing on it and lecturing on it. So if we would take a screenshot of gender relations today, we would see that all over the world, men are working longer hours and are earning considerably more, and that women are spending longer hours on childcare and housework. But if instead we took a cross-generational film, we'd see that men are spending more time on childcare and more time on housework than they ever did in the 20th century. And that women are, are spending longer hours at work. Now, a great deal has been written on whether the gender gap is closing in the world at work, but not so much has been written on the world of the home. But there too, the changes are real. Just a couple of examples. In uh, 1965, American men put in just 13% of the combined childcare and housework. By 2011, that had risen to 35%. And bear with me, just one more. In 1957, 1% of British fathers attended the births of their children. Today, 93%. So it's clear that the tectonic plates are shifting in the way that men relate to their children, but perhaps not quite as fast as the way that women are relating to the world at work. Now, why is that? And one answer might be that it's perfectly natural. And there's some truth in that. After all, women have nine months of pregnancy, and that allows them to bond with their babies in a way that's not available to fathers. But there's a widespread belief that it goes far, far further than that, that men are hardwired for single-minded striving, and that women are hardwired for caring and sharing and the multitasking that's so necessary to run a family and a household. And Related to that is a view that women are drenched with these loving, nurturing hormones, and this helps prompt their maternal instinct. So let's have a look at these two claims, starting with the multitasking one. And this is often based on the belief that men's brains and women's brains are completely different. And those holding this belief often say that the communication center between the two hemispheres of our brain, which is called the corpus callosum, is larger and more substantial in a woman's brain than in a man's brain. And this helps them be much better multitaskers. And this is simply untrue. There have been hundreds of studies of the size of the corpus callosum, and there's no gender difference whatsoever in them. And by the way, there have also been studies of multitasking ability, and again, no gender difference. Now, the issue of hormones that, that um, prompt maternal instinct is a trickier one. The two candidates there are the so-called love hormone oxytocin and the social bonding hormone vasopressin. And again, there's a belief that these are female-only hormones, and again, this is false. Um, in fact, one very large sample study showed that vasopressin levels were slightly higher in boys, oxytocin levels slightly higher in girls, but the differences were minuscule. Now, certainly, women do receive an oxytocin boost during pregnancy, but studies have also shown that men receive an oxytocin boost through intimate contact with their children. So I think what we could say is that both men and women get a nurturing instinct boost from spending time with their children. One argument that I often heard when I was raising my children was that we new dads were a kind of cultural aberration, going against thousands of years of history and tens of thousands of years of prehistory. Well, actually, we know absolutely nothing about gender in, in prehistory, but what the least we can say, or the, the, the little thing we can say, is that studies of tribes today, hunter-gatherer tribes, the few remaining hunter-gatherer tribes today, show that in several of them, 
fathers play a very substantial role. And one of these studies involved the Aka community in the Congo Basin. Um, Barry Hewlett, an American anthropologist, spent 13 years um, studying them. And he found that Aka dads spent at least five times as much time with their infants as was the norm in Western society. And he often absorbed, um, observed them, holding them close to their bodies for an hour or more at a time and letting them suck on their nipples. Now, I mentioned this little example because what we often assume to be immutable and innate turns out to be cultural and therefore changeable. We are not computers, and our brains really aren't hardwired for anything much at all. Instead, they are molded by experience. Now, certainly cultural traditions going back thousands of years can be very hard to budge. But sometimes economic necessity has a way of opening up options here and closing off others there. And that is as true of the household as it is of the workplace. So if women are narrowing the gap in terms of hours spent at work, but are still way outpacing men when it comes to hours spent on childcare and housework, then something has to give. And it's not likely that women are going to retreat from the world at work, not when girls are outperforming boys in just about every subject in just about every country. So the other alternative is that men increase their domestic role so that in future the presence of fathers in playgroups would be unremarkable and no one would say, it's so nice that you take a turn with the babysitting. I want to end on a more personal note. I've already mentioned how the experience of having two daughters nudged me to understand that fatherhood was a feminist issue. And along the way, I came to see that feminism had a lot to offer me as a man specifically, that I would broaden my horizons if I embraced the idea that I was good at nurturing children and that the ability to read their emotions or indeed express my own was not beyond me, and that the multitasking necessary to run a household was also within my range. And I also came to see that my prime role in life wasn't one of shimmying up a greasy career ladder while somebody else looked after my children. And for that matter, that I didn't always need to wear the trousers in my relationships, as my father used to put it. So while feminism is mainly about the advance of women, it seems to me it also has a lot to offer in terms of the advance of men. What it offers us is a much broader perspective of our own humanity, more room to spread our wings as fathers, as lovers, and as human beings. Thank you.